welcome back to the Antisocial Studies Podcast, a place for people who wish they'd stayed awake in high school. Last time, we saw the clash of the great European militaries and the crushing defeat of Germany. Everything was totally settled forever. Today, we'll talk about the war that was directly caused by the war to end all wars. Talk about irony. The world gets depressed, Hitler rises, and everything falls apart. This is Antisocial Studies. I'm Emily Glenkler. Settle in, and let's go back in time. Act 1, The Depression After World War I, all of the major powers turned inward and focused on rebuilding their own economies. Nowhere was this more difficult than in Germany. If you remember, they were saddled with billions of dollars in reparations payments, and as they struggled to pay the Allies, France invaded and occupied the Rhineland, a region in Germany that was very important for industrial production. This made it even harder for their economy to rebuild. By 1923, hyperinflation was rampant in Germany. In 1918, one paper mark was worth one gold mark. That makes sense. But just five years later, to buy one gold mark, you would need one trillion paper marks. To put it another way, if you were an American tourist visiting Germany in 1923, you would head to a bank to exchange your currency. You would hand them one U.S. dollar, and they would give you over four trillion German marks. What? That is insane, and that's hyperinflation. In the 1920s, people in Germany would use their paper money to wallpaper their homes. Families realized that instead of buying firewood, it was cheaper to just burn their money instead. Mothers were seen with wheelbarrows full of cash just to buy basic supplies like bread. But then, the American banks stepped in. Woohoo! What could go wrong? American banks began funneling money into Germany in the 1920s to help them rebuild their economy and make their reparations payments to France and Britain. The new democratic government in Germany, the Weimar Republic, created a new currency that helped with the inflation. And everything seemed to be going okay by early 1929. Meanwhile, in the United States, in the decades leading up to the war, tons of Americans had moved to the cities for the first time seeking industrial jobs. During World War I, many men returning from combat stayed in cities instead of returning home. In a way, it's like what happened during the Crusades. By 1920, more Americans were living in cities than in rural areas, a huge turning point. With many people living in cities and the introduction of credit, spending and speculative investment increased rapidly throughout the 1920s. Cue stock jazz music, y'all know the drill. Speakeasies, flappers, great Gatsby-type new money. New companies were making tons of money and reinvesting it in speculative expansion. And while corporate profits skyrocketed, wages only barely increased, leading to a huge gap between the rich and the poor. For example, the wealthiest 1% owned one-third of all American wealth. So the Occupy Wall Street movement was way less original than it thought. By 1929, the spending and investment reached its bubble point, and the stock market collapsed. Many Americans, concerned that the banks had been investing their savings in speculative stocks, which they had, ran to the banks to withdraw their money. Over the next few years, thousands of banks shut their doors, and bank deposits were not insured, so as banks closed, people lost their entire life savings. As the American economy collapsed, so did the economies of those around the world that were tied to it, and none more so than Germany, who was relying almost entirely on American banks fueling their reparations payments. Many other European countries had relied on American banks in the 1920s to invest money while they rebuilt after the war, too. And, to make it worse, in 1930, the U.S. passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff that would protect American companies. Trade with other countries dropped dramatically as everyone retreated inward to try to protect their own companies and workers. And with the other major powers of the world closing their doors, it was that much easier for new extreme leaders to rise. Act 2, The Rise of Hitler The worldwide depression had a lot of impacts, but none more important than the rise of extreme dictatorships around the world. We see this in Russia with the rise of Stalin, Italy with Mussolini, and Japan with its intense military government. But for today, we're going to focus on Germany. Adolf Hitler fought in World War I after getting rejected from art school. Man, if I had a time machine, just like let the guy do his stupid paintings. Hitler experienced the devastation and shame of the German World War I loss in the trenches, 
and it was then that he also realized that he had a gift for public speaking and persuasion. When he returned from the war, he joined a new young party called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party for short. They had risen out of the conservative, far-right paramilitary groups that fought against new communist movements in Germany after the war, and their goal was to draw workers away from communism and toward their new German nationalist movement. A quick note about the name, the Nazi party believed in national socialism, but this is not related to Karl Marx or communism or socialism the way we think of it today at all. In fact, the communists were the original enemy of the Nazi party. National socialism in Germany was the idea that Germany had been weakened by the introduction of new social groups in its country. Ethnic minorities had weakened and destabilized German society. So, for Germany to be great again, they would need to focus on intense nationalism and eradicating undesirable elements of society, thus national socialism. Adolf Hitler did not found the Nazi party, but he rose to become its leader very early on. In 1923, he led 2,000 Nazis in a march into the center of Munich to try to overthrow the new democratic government that they blamed for the horrible Treaty of Versailles and all of Germany's weakness. The Nazis clashed with police, and 16 of them and four police officers were killed. This was called the Beer Hall Putsch, and it failed, and it caused Hitler to be thrown in prison for treason. While in prison, Hitler was quite comfortable. He was still allowed to meet with other Nazi leaders, and he wrote Mein Kampf. This book outlined his ideas about National Socialism and his hatred for ethnic minorities, especially the Jews. He unfortunately only spent nine months in prison, but when he was released, the German economy was improving. To most of German society, the Nazi party was a tiny, fringe, conservative movement that would never be heard from again. It wasn't until 1929, when the U.S. economy collapsed, and with it, German stability, that the Nazi party became an influential party. Even at its height, it was still in the minority, but it became powerful enough that the mainstream moderate political parties had to acknowledge it and allow it seats at the table. And this is one of the problems with governments that allow for, like, an infinite number of political parties. Yes, it helps give a voice to smaller groups, which can be good. But it also allows for small fringe movements to gain more legitimacy. In the U.S., for example, our two-party system does make it really difficult for small groups to be heard, which is bad. But it also makes it harder in the U.S. for extremism to rise on either side of the spectrum in a way that would be legitimized in the government. I say this... I might need to edit this in the next few years. Hmm. So, spurred by the German people's frustration with the terrible economic conditions and the national shame from the Treaty of Versailles, the Nazis gained over half the seats in the German parliament. But still, the German president Hindenburg had to decide to make Hitler chancellor. So, why did he do it? Whenever a society is experiencing economic devastation, it is more common for extreme groups to rise on either side. While the Nazis were rising on the far right, the communists were rising on the far left, and the majority of Germans were stuck in the middle. But the far right seemed less scary than the communists, who were advocating a complete overthrow of their capitalist society. So a lot of the moderates made a deal with the Nazis and Hitler, and Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany in 1933 to appease those groups. Hitler was truly a political mastermind. He knew that if he went from complete democracy to total dictatorship in one step, the German people would reject it. He learned that after his failed revolt in 1923. So from this point on, Hitler would slowly increase his own power and ban political opponents. The first people sent to Dachau, the first concentration camp, were members of the Communist Party in the early 1930s. He justified this by blaming the burning of the Reichstag, the German parliament building on a communist arsonist, But even without this event, most moderates were okay with kicking out the communists from the government because they were seen as spies for the Soviet enemy to the east. But Hitler didn't stop with the communists. He slowly outlawed all other political parties and created a totalitarian state where the Nazi party ruled every part of society. Hitler appealed to the masses in Germany with his powerful speeches and his promises to bring Germany back to greatness. He talked often about the shameful Treaty of Versailles and he repeatedly violated it during the 1930s. After becoming chancellor, he used Germany's industry to rebuild the military, going against the treaty after World War I. This made the military happy and brought them over to Hitler's side. And he also made corporations and industrial powers happy by freeing them from the post-World War I restrictions. And around Europe, Britain and France allowed this to happen because a lot of them realized that the Treaty of Versailles had been too harsh to begin with. So the two main causes of World War II are Hitler's aggression and 
and Europe's appeasement. For Hitler's part, he slowly expanded outside of Germany's borders, but he started with areas that could somewhat logically be seen as rightfully German. First, he reoccupied the Rhineland, that industrial region that had been taken over by France in the 1920s, but this had already been within Germany's borders, and France had sort of illegally invaded it, so no one thought too much about it. Then, in 1938, he annexed Austria, which was another German-speaking nation to the south. You know about this because you've seen The Sound of Music. And if you haven't seen The Sound of Music, then I would like for you to stop listening to my podcast immediately and not come back until you have. It's important to note that not all Austrians were like Captain Von Trapp. There were parades welcoming Hitler to Vienna. Remember, Austria had experienced the same defeat and shame during World War I that the Germans had. But a turning point happened in 1938, when Hitler annexed the Sudetenland. This is a region in Czechoslovakia that was mostly inhabited by German-speaking people. And at this point, the major European powers decided that they needed to meet with this Hitler guy and make sure that he wasn't going to expand beyond just linguistically German parts of Europe. Britain and France met with Hitler in Munich and hammered out a deal. Known as the Munich Pact, this agreement stated that Britain and France would allow Hitler to keep the land he had already annexed but only if he promised that he would stop there. By the way, no one from the Sudetenland was represented, obviously, at this meeting. So Hitler was like, of course, of course, I promise this is my last annexation. You have my word. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned home waving the agreement in the air, literally, and triumphantly stated that peace has been established for our time. Yeah, that's going to come back to haunt him. Back in Germany, Hitler was negotiating a secret agreement with his enemy, Stalin. Both men hated each other, partly because of their differing ideologies. Fascism, in Hitler's world, worships the state above the individual. It is basically extreme nationalism and loyalty to the government above concern for individual citizens. Fascists typically support capitalism, and they believe that extreme social hierarchy leads to a controlled and successful society. Communists, on the other hand, believe in theory, the exact opposite. They believe that the state should exist to serve the people, and part of that is redistributing wealth so that everyone is relatively equal. Now, of course, in practice, this version of communism never happens. And ironically, communist governments end up looking very similar to fascist ones. They end up both being totalitarian states where their party rules everything, so Stalin's Russia in reality looks a lot like Hitler's Germany. The other reason why they're enemies is because they both have ambitions to conquer Eastern Europe. So Hitler meets with Stalin, and they sign the Non-Aggression Pact. Basically, this says that if Hitler were to, I don't know, like invade Poland, Stalin shouldn't see this as an act of aggression. They agree to split up Eastern Europe and keep the peace so that both can focus on being brutal dictators without worrying about war with each other. By the way, Poland has always been seen as an important buffer state to check the power of Germany and Russia. Britain and France have repeatedly made it clear that Poland should be considered sacred territory that should not be taken over. But Hitler doesn't believe that Europe will actually do anything even if he does invade Poland. Why not? Well, that brings us to the second major cause of World War II, appeasement. The other major world powers were willing to ignore the rise of Hitler in favor of focusing on their own problems during the 1930s. Britain and France felt bad about the harsh Treaty of Versailles and didn't want to get embroiled in another world war. The U.S. was busy new dealing and rebuilding its economy, or trying to, and Stalin's Russia was purging its enemies and solidifying his power. So every time Hitler took a step, the rest of the world gave in in an effort to avoid another world war. It's like if you give a mouse a cookie, but instead it's if you give a Hitler the Sudetenland, he's going to want a Poland. Side note, a young JFK attending Harvard actually published a book about this in 1940, like as it was happening while he was still a Harvard student. The book was called Why England Slept, and it was all about basically the appeasement of Hitler in the 1930s. So ignoring the Munich Pact, obviously, I mean, he's Hitler. Germany invades Poland on September 1st, 1939. Britain and France are outraged and really embarrassed that Hitler cared so little about their warnings. And it's this event that is the official beginning of World War II. Act 3, The War For the first few years of World War II, the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and eventually Japan, are rapidly expanding. The Germans successfully used their Lightning War, or Blitzkrieg, 
The idea was to quickly invade a place rather than waiting for all parts of your military before advancing. Using new technology like the radio, airplanes, and other motorized vehicles, the German army was able to concentrate its attack on one part of the enemy's lines. Breaking through, they would create chaos and disorganization amongst the enemies, while their slower-moving military elements came later and swept up what was left. In 1940, Hitler quickly invaded and conquered most of France. The French signed an armistice, and the Nazis set up a government of French collaborators known as the Vichy government. The French resistance fled to the unoccupied territories or to other countries, but not before they did everything they could to prevent Hitler from benefiting from their culture. Art historians boxed up the greatest treasures of the Louvre and smuggled them out of France. The Mona Lisa, for example, was boxed up and moved five times around the French countryside and eventually in quiet abbeys. Based on this fact and the sound of music, it seems like the greatest adversary of the Nazis were nuns, and I kind of love it. Similarly, the Last Supper, which was a fresco painted on a wall in Milan, was protected by sandbags and scaffolding when eventually the Allies invaded Italy. This likely saved it when the Allies bombed the city, and almost all of the church was blown apart, but the wall with the Last Supper remained standing. Back to Paris, the French resistance also cut the lines on the elevators in the Eiffel Tower. They knew that Hitler would want to visit their most famous monument, but they wanted to make sure that that bastard would have to walk to get to the top. So great. Also, when the Nazis conquered France, British troops were pushed to the coastline. The movie Dunkirk does a pretty fantastic job of showing the evacuation of the British forces in France. And also, it turns out Harry Styles is a pretty decent actor. Who knew? With France conquered, Britain was the only Allied power fighting the Nazis. Hitler ordered a bombardment of England that lasted almost a year. The Blitz bombed English industrial targets, towns, and cities. And this is a great example of the newish concept of total war. In traditional warfare, before the 20th century, it was generally understood that war should be fought between militaries alone. Civilians and non-military towns were typically safe. But in World War I, and even more so in World War II, this concept was thrown out the window. With industrialization and the importance of the home front to support the troops, both sides viewed all parts of the country as fair game. At one point during the Blitz, London was bombed for 56 straight days and nights. More than 40,000 civilians were killed by the German bombs, and a million homes were destroyed or seriously damaged in London. And typically, we associate this event with the Keep Calm and Carry On posters that are now weirdly everywhere. And this was a government propaganda campaign meant to raise morale in the early years of the war, but the poster actually was rarely displayed, which makes all of those Keep Calm and Chive On shirts even more annoying and unnecessary, like stop wearing them. Hitler could not figure out why the British weren't surrendering. He figured that the only reason must be that they were holding out hope that their former World War allies, the Russians, might step in and help them. So Hitler being Hitler, he decides that he should just invade Russia. Why not? In 1941, Hitler broke the non-aggression pact and invaded the Soviet Union. The invasion began in June, and believing that his blitzkrieg forces would subdue Russia easily, Hitler did not send his troops with winter supplies. The Germans advanced quickly and got very close to Moscow, but the lightning war was more difficult than a vast empire like Russia. The front forces got way far ahead of the rear, and Hitler also got a little distracted. He split off some of his forces to conquer Stalingrad. It was an important industrial center, but actually the reason Hitler wanted it was because it had Stalin's name in it. Ugh. Hitler also split off another force to travel south toward the Caucasus to shore up oil supplies, and his overconfidence ended in disaster. By the winter, his troops were stranded far in the Russian interior and disconnected from supply lines. Most famously, the Battle of Stalingrad saw the German soldiers surrounded by Russians and forced to spend the Russian winter in foxholes outside. This battle was the turning point in the eastern front of the war because the Russians stopped the Nazi advance. Military historians consider the Battle of Stalingrad to be the greatest battle of the war, and it was also one of the bloodiest conflicts in history, with over two million casualties in that battle alone. At around the same time that the Germans were invading Russia, Japan got involved in the war by bombing the U.S. Navy at Pearl Harbor. So, most of us who are Americans know the basics about the date which will live in infamy, but what we don't know about is the historical context of this event. We typically just teach that the Japanese randomly attacked us in Hawaii, and so then we went to war. I mean, that's basically the gist of it, but there's a little more to it. The U.S. and Japan had been slowly inching toward conflict for decades. 
Both wanted to be the main imperial power in the Pacific. Remember after the Spanish-American War when the U.S. took control of places like Guam and the Philippines? That was around the same time that Japan was coming out of its Meiji Restoration, industrialized and looking to expand. They started in Korea, where they clashed with Russia in 1905. And after Germany lost World War I, both the U.S. and Japan took control of some of their territories in the Pacific. But the biggest sticking point between the two new powers was China. In 1937, Japan declared war on China. They invaded the mainland and committed atrocities like the Rape of Nanking, which was China's capital at the time. During this event, they killed 150,000 war, quote, prisoners. I don't know that a lot of them were actually in the military. They killed 50,000 civilians, and they raped at least 20,000 women and girls. The Japanese government still to this day denies that this event ever happened. In response to the Japanese invasion of China, which was not communist yet in China, and they were still allied with the United States, the U.S. put strict sanctions on Japan. These sanctions severely limited Japanese access to money and goods, especially oil. Both sides had been negotiating for years, but neither side, the U.S. or Japan, was willing to give in. And it was in this context that the Japanese committed their surprise attack on U.S. forces at Pearl Harbor, where almost the entire American fleet was stationed at the time. The attack was successful. They destroyed 20 ships and 300 airplanes, and most importantly, 2,000 people were killed. But the next day, the United States declared war on Japan. And from that point on, we sent troops to both Europe to fight the Nazis and to the new Pacific theater of the war. In the Pacific, the fighting mostly consisted of island hopping. The Marines would lead the way, storming tiny, often uninhabited, except for Japanese troops, islands, where the Japanese soldiers had taken up defensive positions. The idea was to essentially leapfrog, capturing enough islands to set up airstrips so you could eventually get close enough to Japan to attack directly. And island hopping makes it sound kind of fun. It was not. It was brutal. If you haven't seen The Pacific, the 10-part HBO miniseries, you need to watch it. It's incredible, and also has a lot of really famous white male actors that, like, you know, but you can't ever remember their name. So that's fun. The turning point in the war in the Pacific was the Battle of Midway. The naval fleet that had escaped destruction at Pearl Harbor was camped out near the island of Midway, and the Japanese wanted to destroy it. The Japanese had made a plan to attack an island near Pearl Harbor and draw the American fleet into a trap, but the Americans were able to break the Japanese code and learn the entire plan. Pacific Fleet Commander Chester W. Nimitz put his ships in a position to surprise the Japanese ships that were setting up the trap. The Battle of Midway was incredible because it was a naval battle during which none of the ships ever actually saw the other side's fleet. Basically, this was a real-life game of battleship where planes would take off from aircraft carriers. Flying high over the Pacific, they would track down the enemy fleet and drop bombs, hopefully leaving them enough fuel to return to their ships. In the end, the Americans destroyed four fleet carriers with 322 airplanes and over 5,000 Japanese men on board. This was the turning point, after which the U.S. forces would be slowly pushing the Japanese back toward Japan. So looking at the global conflict, the tide has turned in the Pacific with Midway and on the eastern front with Stalingrad. Now the Allies have to figure out how to take back control of Western Europe. In 1943, they come up from the south through North Africa and eventually Italy. But the last major turning point is the Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied France, known as D-Day. Officially, this is known as the Battle of Normandy, and its codename was Operation Overlord. Fun fact, the D in D-Day just stands for day. It was always used as a placeholder term by the military when talking about an operation to just mean D-Day, the day the thing will happen. This was helpful because if a communication was intercepted, they didn't give away the actual day, but also as a way to talk about an operation if a final date hadn't been determined yet. They also used the term H hour for the time it would start. So for example, D plus two meant two days after the day the operation was scheduled to start, or H minus one meant one hour before the start time. Anyway. On June 6, 1944, 156,000 American, Canadian, and British forces landed on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of heavily fortified French coastline. 5,000 ships and 11,000 aircraft also provided support. Other paratroopers had already parachuted into France and were behind enemy lines to gain control of important infrastructure like roads and bridges to allow the invading forces to march through France. Again, there's an HBO miniseries called Band of Brothers that follows a group of paratroopers who are involved in D-Day. It's amazing. 
All of this took an enormous amount of coordination and planning, all of which was overseen by American Dwight D. Eisenhower, our future president. Over 420,000 people were killed or went missing during the Battle of Normandy, and the Allied victory turned the tide in the war in Europe. From this point on, the Allies are advancing toward the heart of the Axis powers. The Americans, French, and British are closing in on Germany from the west, and the Russians are coming from the east. And the Americans are also getting close to bombing range of Japan. Cool side story. Hitler didn't know where the D-Day invasion would come from. He had been working on building a massive 2,400-foot-long Atlantic wall made up of bunkers, landmines, and other obstacles, but he couldn't pinpoint where the attack would come from. And part of this was because of this incredible misinformation campaign from the Allies called Operation Bodyguard. If I didn't still have laryngitis, I would totally break into a rendition of Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You, but I'll spare y'all from that for now. You're welcome. Operation Bodyguard was a massive attempt to confuse Hitler and keep him guessing on where the D-Day invasion was coming from. The British had discovered and flipped 12 Nazi spies who worked as double agents spreading false plans. One was that the British were going, to, were going through Scotland to meet up with the Soviets and invade south through Norway. Agents even created fake radio chatter about cold weather issues like ski bindings, and Hitler sent one of his fighting divisions into Scandinavia weeks before D-Day. They also developed an entirely fake fighting force named the 1st U.S. Army Group to convince Hitler that they would be coming across at Calais, the shortest distance across the English Channel, so the most logical place for the D-Day invasion to happen. They published fake wedding notices for non-existent soldiers in the local English paper. They built fake landing craft made of painted canvas pulled across wooden frames, and they even had inflatable tanks. These tanks would be moved during the night with people using massive rollers in the dirt so, so it looked like tire tracks. All of this was so that German planes flying overhead would see what looked like a huge force amassing on the coast. The icing on the cake was that this entirely fake first U.S. Army group was headed by the very real General George Patton, the person who the Nazis believed would logically lead the invasion. Far away from the front, Allied codebreakers like Benedict Cumberbatch, you've all seen the imitation game, right? Helped confirm that the Germans had fallen for the ruse. For good measure, they even hired an Australian actor who looked a lot like the English General Bernard Montgomery to impersonate him. He studied his mannerisms and then flew off to Gibraltar less than two weeks before the invasion. The Nazis believed that there was no way the attack would occur with the British general off in the Mediterranean. The amazing thing about all of this was that it worked. Even after the invasion at Normandy, a Spanish double agent fed information to Berlin that the Normandy invasion was actually a red herring. He convinced Hitler that this was all an attempt to draw his best troops away from Calais, where the real invasion would occur. After all, General Patton hadn't left the preparation site just across the English Channel. Hitler was so convinced that this was the case that he delayed releasing reinforcements from Calais for seven weeks, allowing Allied troops to make their way across the beaches and into the French countryside. So awesome. By 1945, the Allied powers were closing in on all sides. The Battle of the Bulge that occurred the previous winter was the last huge defense by the Nazis before they were retreating into German territory. At that point, it was a race to Berlin between the English, French, and Americans from the West and the Soviets from the East. The Soviets got there first, but not before Hitler committed suicide in his bunker on April 30th, 1945. Germany surrendered just one week later, but the war in the Pacific continued. Weighing the general desire for the war to be over and the belief that the Japanese were going to fight to the last man, President Truman decided to drop two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing over 200,000 people. Even though it's easy to think that this is what ended the war, in reality, the Japanese leadership seemed more concerned about the Soviets' unexpected entry into the war in the Pacific two days after the bombing of Hiroshima. Up until this point, the Soviets had honored their non-aggression pact with Japan, and the Japanese believed that they could serve as intermediaries to negotiate an end to the war. But between Hiroshima on August 6th, Soviet entry into the Pacific on August 8th, and the bombing of Nagasaki on August 9th, the Japanese surrendered. After six years of fighting, World War II was finally over, but as Allied forces swept across the former Third Reich, they were only just beginning to fully understand exactly what they'd been fighting for. Act 4, The Holocaust. I'll be honest, I really didn't want to write this part of the episode. Partly because it makes me sad and uncomfortable, but more so because I know I can't do it justice. 
There are so many better resources than me to explore in depth the various aspects of the Holocaust. One of the best being the U.S. Holocaust Museum Museum and Memorial website. So I'm not going to attempt to do a less good version of what they've already created. Instead, I want to talk about something that a lot of classes don't cover but should. Why was there so much anti-Semitism in the world by the 1930s? Throughout most of history, Jews have been a minority group in whichever empire or country they've lived. And historically, Jewish communities typically maintained a distinct culture and did not assimilate into the larger community. And this caused them to be seen as outsiders, even in places where they lived for centuries. And because of this, the Jewish communities were often scapegoats when things went wrong. In the ancient era, the kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, and the Jews were forced into exile or captivity. They were eventually freed by Cyrus the Great and allowed to return home, but they never again established their own independent state. During the classical era, the Jewish people were one minority group who experienced ethnic discrimination. Typically, the Greeks and then the Romans were fairly xenophobic and believed other ethnicities were beneath them. But during the Roman Empire, the Jews became a somewhat privileged minority. They were way more united than other subjugated groups, and a series of semi-successful rebellions allowed them to be given rights that other groups were not given by the Romans. For one, the Jews were allowed to worship their one god instead of the Roman pantheon. And this was good for the Jewish people, but it put a target on their backs by other subjugated groups who were resentful of their privileged status. As the Islamic empire swept across the Middle East, the Muslims viewed tax collecting as a job too low, quote-unquote, for themselves, and so Jews stepped into this typically unpopular occupation as a way to make a living. And this was mirrored in medieval Europe. The medieval Christian church said that usury, or the charging of interest, was a sin. So because of this, Jewish minorities in a mostly Christian Europe stepped into the fields of tax collecting and banking, and this often made Jewish communities very wealthy but highly unpopular, and it also generated a few problematic stereotypes over time. Think about it. Jewish communities were often separated from Christian society in Europe by choice or more often by force from the Christian communities. So if you were a medieval Christian, you would never interact with a Jewish person, except when he was knocking on your door to either collect taxes or ask for their loan back. A stereotype arose of Jewish people as greedy or tricking, quote unquote, good Christians out of their money. Add on top of this the biblical interpretation that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, you've got a lot of hatred brewing across Europe. Another problem with Jewish communities being physically separated from the Christian majority was that when disease swept across Europe, the Jews were less affected. Again, this was good for the Jews, but superstitious Christians who didn't understand the science of disease blamed the Jews for events like the Black Plague. In one town, 900 Jewish people were burned alive because Christians believed that this could prevent the plague from reaching their town. By the 1700s, rising nationalism contributed more to the problem. As European nation-states grew more unified and proud of their shared heritage, the fact that the Jewish communities maintained a a distinct culture separated them from this unifying experience. And by the 1800s, scientific racism began classifying Jews as a race instead of just a religion. Now, this isn't entirely unreasonable because Judaism has historically been an ethnic religion. This means that Jews don't view it as their duty to go out and convert everyone to their faith— And in other eras, Jews were encouraged to marry within their same ethnic group to keep the community united. But by seeing Judaism as a race, Europeans have passed a crucial milestone that will make it hard for Jews to save themselves in the Nazi Third Reich. Adolf Hitler was born in 1889 in Austria. It's funny, I have an Austrian exchange student in my class this year, and she told me that basically Austrians teach it that Hitler was from Germany, and then Germans make sure to emphasize that Hitler was born in Austria. No one wants Hitler. In the late 1800s, Jewish minorities across Eastern Europe and Russia were being violently attacked and forced out in things called pogroms. Some Jewish families left Europe altogether and came to the United States. Turns out my great-grandfather was one of these people. Thanks, Ancestry.com. But a lot of the Jews fled Russia into countries like Poland, Germany, and Austria. And in those places, they were viewed with distrust and often as illegal immigrants who were diluting the historic Aryan culture of Central and Western Europe. It's important to note that there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States at the time as well. Hitler was a teenager in Vienna when the city was ruled by a very conservative mayor. He repeatedly won elections by blaming these new Jewish immigrants for the bad economic times and other social problems in Austria. 
Hitler learned that blaming a perceived outside group can unite a nation together against a common enemy. And he also just grows up in a time of rampant anti-Semitism where hatred, or at least distrust of Jews, was very common. At the end of World War I, the German government led by the Kaiser was overthrown. A new democracy called the Weimar Republic was established, and in this new era, Jews and other minority groups were respected and given more rights and equality. Jewish intellectuals were also welcomed into universities that had previously been closed off to them. And to far-right nationalists, this looked suspicious. A conspiracy theory arose in the years after World War I called the Stabbed in the Back Theory. The idea in, in Germany was that the Jews, along with other liberal, quote, unwanted elements like the communists, had orchestrated the terrible Treaty of Versailles. Some people on the far right even believed that Germany was winning the war, but these subversive elements betrayed the military by negotiating with the Allies. To be clear, this is completely untrue, but this idea takes hold in the more radical conservative groups in Germany, and the Nazis capitalized on this resentment for their own gain. By the time Hitler and the Nazis rose to power in 1933, the Jews were regarded as completely non-German. They were linked with the global communist movement and blamed for the destruction and economic collapse of Germany, especially since they were still very influential in the global global banking industry. So it was not a difficult leap for many Germans to make that the way to make Germany great again was by uniting true ethnic Germans in Germany, Austria, and other parts of Central Europe against the rising Jewish threat. Throughout the 1930s, Hitler gradually stripped the Jewish people of their rights. In 1935, he passed the Nuremberg Laws that deprived Jews of German citizenship, including the right to vote. Jewish stores were boycotted, and they were forced to carry ID cards. In 1938, the Nazis orchestrated an event known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. At the time, this was portrayed as spontaneous acts of violence against synagogues and Jewish businesses and homes. But in reality, the Nazi party organized the event and just made it look like an impulsive act by mobs of Germans. At this point, the Nazi party reasons to the public that the Jewish people need to be separated from German society for their own safety. Jewish parts of town are walled off with guards out front, and any Jews who didn't already live in the Jewish quarters are forced to move to these ghettos. But when the war begins in 1939, Jews are rounded up and shipped out of the cities completely. Again, the justification is that they need to be separate for everyone's safety, There's a general concern that the Jews are spies for the communist Russians. And fortunately, this is pretty similar to the way the United States treated its Japanese citizens during World War II, especially on the West Coast. After Pearl Harbor, Japanese-American citizens were forced to live in internment camps for the duration of the war out of fear that they might spy for Japan. There were many people across the Third Reich who actively supported the Nazi party and its policies. There is no denying this. But... It's important to acknowledge that there were also a lot of people who chose to support the Nazis out of fear for their own safety. People who resisted, and there were many of them, were often sent off to the camps themselves. And this doesn't mean that people didn't have a choice. They could have chosen to resist and risk their lives, but that's something that's easier said than done, especially from the comfort of the 21st century. Throughout World War II, the Holocaust was occurring. By the end, over 11 million people were systematically murdered in the concentration camps, This number included 6 million Jews, but also 5 million other, quote, undesirable groups like gypsies, homosexuals, communists, the disabled, and religious and political opponents of the Nazis. Side note, speaking of mentally ill people or perceived mentally ill people being killed in the Holocaust, just recently, like in the last month, there's been a lot of new scholarship about Dr. Asperger, the guy who kind of coined the phrase Asperger's on the autism spectrum. It's been found out that he was a doctor working in Nazi Vienna during the war, um, and he helped identify kids who had what would now be called Asperger's, and he also referred and signed off on them being sent off to the camps to be euthanized. So right now, there's actually a movement brewing amongst parents and children that are affected by Asperger's to get the name changed to something different so it's not associated with his legacy. So back to Nazi Germany, who knew and who didn't? And that's the question the Allies were tasked with figuring out after the end of the war, and it's impossible to know for sure. Obviously, those who worked in the camps knew what was going on. But the further away you live from a camp, which were often located in remote rural areas, the more reasonable it is that you might not have known exactly what was happening. 
German newsreel during the war gave citizens tours of the concentration camps. In these videos, the Jews are shown swimming, playing sports, and performing in orchestras. The Nazis explained that they were being well cared for in this summer camp-like environment, just for their safety and everyone else's safety for the duration of the war. Members of the Red Cross even visited some of the concentration camps during the war, and the Nazis put on a good show. They paraded them in front of healthy-looking inmates who performed for the visitors and spoke about how well they were being treated. There were articles published in the New York Times throughout the war referencing prisoners who had escaped, but their stories of gas chambers and experimentation on children were generally viewed as just too insane to be true, and these stories never made front-page news. After the war, the high-ranking Nazi officials, especially those who organized the so-called Final Solution, were punished at the Nuremberg Trials. Unfortunately, many of the highest officials escaped and were never brought to justice. Joseph Mengele, the brutal doctor who performed horrific experiments on twins at Auschwitz, fled to Argentina and lived for a few more decades before he died during an ocean swim. Jewish Nazi hunters spent the rest of their lives tracking down Nazis and bringing them to justice, often in the newly created state of Israel. Today, the German government has fully come to terms with the horrors of the Holocaust. Concentration camps have been preserved as living museums, and there's a general German shame that is referred to as struggling to come to terms with the past. It's a much longer German word that I cannot pronounce. Every year, my high school hosts German exchange students, and they always visit right around the time of the year that we're talking about the Holocaust. These students are always surprised at the fact that we only spend a few days on World War II and the Holocaust. In Germany, students are mandated to learn about this event every year, and there is an entire year of social studies in high school dedicated to just World War II. The equivalent would be if all American students in their sophomore year spent the entire year learning about slavery. For the record, I'm all for it. Act 5, The Post-War World By 1945, World War II had become the deadliest conflict in human history. 78 million people died during the war, and thanks to total war, more civilians died than soldiers. The United States lost 418,000 people, and Great Britain lost 450,000 in the war, which, amazingly, is low compared to the other nations involved. For comparison, Japan lost 3 million, Germany lost 9 million, and Russia lost 23 million people in the war. 23 million dead. The major Axis powers of Germany and Japan were occupied in the years after the war. In Japan, the war ended before the Soviets could get too involved, lucky for the United States. General MacArthur led the complete demilitarization of Japan, and he also was nice enough to write a new constitution for them. We're really good at that. Among other things, this new constitution created a true parliamentary democracy. But in a surprisingly culturally sensitive move, the U.S. decided to allow the Japanese emperor to remain the emperor. But he went back to being a figurehead, especially since his military was now gone. This MacArthur Constitution stated that Japan would never build up a military again. They were allowed a small defense force, but never allowed to build an offensive military. Interestingly, Japan just voted to remove this part of their constitution in 2017, Maybe they don't love the idea of not having their own military so close to places like China and North Korea. I don't know. I wonder why. In Germany, things were more complicated. All of the Allied troops had conquered parts of the country, and they all wanted to say what happened to it after the war. The Soviets wanted to break up the country, never allowing Germany to unify and rise again. They were like, invade me once, shame on me. Invade me twice, you don't get to exist anymore. But the other Allied powers from the West wanted to learn from the mistakes of the Treaty of Versailles. They believed that further punishing Germany would only make it more difficult to establish peace in Europe. So they settled on a compromise. Germany was split into two countries, East Germany, overseen by the Soviets, and West Germany, monitored by the British, French, and Americans. They tried out two different strategies and, well, let's just say that one worked a lot better than the other. The Soviets used East Germany as a satellite state to rebuild Russia. Anything of value, especially for industrial production, was taken from East Germany back to the mother country. And the East German economy was revamped to become part of the Soviet command economy. Meanwhile, in the West, the Americans took the lead in rebuilding the economy. This wasn't all charitable. The U.S. was seriously concerned that out of the poverty of the post-war world, communism might be seen as a popular alternative. But whatever the motivation, West Germany thrived. And nowhere was this easier to see than in the city of Berlin. Berlin was weirdly located deep in the heart of East Germany, 
But it was such an important city that the United States was not willing to let it fall completely into Soviet hands. So the city of Berlin itself was also divided into East and West. So basically, West Berlin was a tiny island city in the middle of East Germany that was technically a part of the West. It's confusing. The Soviets tried to take control by blockading the city after the war, but the United States airlifted in supplies for over a year. After that, the Soviets built the Berlin Wall to keep people from the East from defecting to the West, which was clearly beginning to thrive in the years after the war. Berlin was really the first battleground of the Cold War, but we'll get back to that next episode. Another huge impact of the war is that it directly leads to the end of empires. For one, the Nazis really gave empire building a bad name. I mean, it was always bad, but now imperial expansion was associated with Adolf Hitler, and no one wanted to be in that club. Also, the Allies had spent the entire war issuing propaganda around the world about how they were fighting for freedom against tyranny and dictatorship. After that, it was pretty hard for them to turn around and keep subjugating Africa and Asia. Another factor that led to decolonization was the fact that the colonists fought for the Allied powers. Millions of subjugated people fought and died in the name of freedom, and they were no longer willing to wait for their own independence. Add the fact that the newly created United Nations was getting pretty preachy about ideas like self-determination and human rights. Finally, Europe was destroyed, physically and economically. They could no longer afford to maintain their massive empires, and so Britain, France, and Belgium somewhat willingly granted many new nations independence. Out of the ashes of Europe's destruction, two new superpowers rise. The Soviet Union is amazingly still standing. Again, they lost 23 million people in the war. But their sheer size and the amount of power that Stalin commanded over the government and the economy kept them afloat, much to the chagrin of subjugated nations across Eastern Europe. In the West, the United States emerged as a major powerhouse for the first time in history. Separated from the war by an ocean on either side, the American homeland was relatively unscathed. So American factories, crops, and other industries, all of which had been reinvigorated by the war effort, were primed and ready to help rebuild Europe. And they will rebuild Europe. Partly out of the goodness of our hearts, but also out of the fear that an impoverished Europe might turn to communism. And after the heat of years of world war things begin to get very, very cold. To be continued. For a full transcript of today's episode, check out www.antisocialstudies.org. Join me next time on Antisocial Studies as we explore the Cold War, or I must break you, Wolverines! Don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. If you really like what I'm doing, go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.